Hello everyone. I recently did a video on Euclid's proof of Pythagoras theorem and mentioned a nice problem that arises in the diagram of this proof and you can see it there on the screen. We've got our right angle triangle, we've got our squares on the three sides and Pythagoras theorem states that the area of the two small squares adds up to that of the large square. Now to prove that Euclid adds various lines to the diagram, the perpendicular from A that divides the large square into two rectangles and for each of the small squares, a pair of oblique lines that create some congruent triangles which Euclid used to show that the rectangles correspond to the small squares. If Euclid's proof is unfamiliar to you, do check out my previous video, which is linked in the description. For this video, we're focusing on how it looks from the diagram like BE and CF meet here right on the perpendicular AD. And we're going to look at an ancient proof that they do indeed meet there. This problem comes from one of the various Greek mathematicians who wrote commentaries on Euclid's all-important elements, namely Heron. Heron lived in Alexandria in the first century CE, and lots of the interesting things he wrote are preserved in the original Greek. But his commentary on Elements 1 survived mainly in Arabic translation from a later mathematician who was also writing a commentary on the elements. It's the one by Al-Nairizi, who came from Persia, as his name shows, and was active around the year 900 in Baghdad. The best known source for Al-Nairizi's work is this manuscript in Leiden, which is where I came across the problem recently. Before we look at Heron's proof, I should maybe mention some other methods that we could use. The two that jumped out to me were firstly to set up a coordinate system with AB and AC as its axes. Um, there's then a pretty standard technique for locating the intersection of BE and CF, and then we can check that that's really on the line AD. And then secondly, there's a very fast proof using Chavers' theorem, if you're familiar with that. So I'm really not going to say much about these approaches, but by all means, pause the video if you're interested in working through the uh, points that I've put up on the screen. Anyway, let's go into Heron's solution. It's very different from those, and I think it's very instructive for thinking like an ancient Greek geometer, because at first sight, it involves a bizarre number of additions to the diagram, after which, Heron plucks out the result extremely fast. And to understand all of this uh, act of construction, we need to start with the result that the ancient geometers use a great deal, and that's the idea of complementary parallelograms, or in Greek, parapleurometer. So if you have a parallelogram and draw in a diagonal, elements 143 tells us that if we take any point on the diagonal, draw lines through it, parallel to the sides of the parallelogram and look at the mini parallelograms that we've just created on either side of the diagonal, they have the same area. It isn't difficult to prove this algebraically or using similar triangles, but in Elements Book 1 we haven't introduced the notion of similar triangles yet, so instead we use congruent triangles. The diagonal of any parallelogram splits it into two congruent triangles, they share the diagonal as a side, and the opposite sides of the parallelogram are equal, so we've got side-side-side congruence. Then if we look in the figure, we can see that the areas on either side of the diagonal AC are going to be equal, but also the areas on either side of AE and EC in the smaller parallelograms are equal. And when we subtract, we get our result. Heron also needs the converse of this result, and he actually goes into a very elaborate proof which I think is partly him showing off what you can do without using similar triangles. But anyway, we can leave all that aside and derive the converse quite simply. Suppose we take some point F, which is not on the diagonal AC. Let's say it's below it, but it will be the same if it was above. Then we draw our two lines through F, and we can compare the complementary parallelograms produced by F with those produced by the point E, where one of those lines through F meets the diagonal. We know that the complementary parallelograms from E are equal, and when we move from E to F, one of the pair gets smaller while the other one gets bigger, so the equality clearly can't be preserved. Well, we therefore get that the complementary parallelograms are equal if and only if they're generated by a point on the diagonal, and the powerful thing about this is that it gives you a test for whether a point lies on a line or not. You can make the line a di diagonal of a well-chosen parallelogram, construct the complementary parallelograms from that point and see whether or not they have the same area. And that's why Heron used this result in our main problem. We need to test whether the intersection of two lines also lies on a third line. 
So Heron therefore constructed no fewer than six new lines and ten new points to create this grid of rectangles. So we're looking for complementary parallelograms, but here we've got the special case where we've got all sorts of right angles. So the parallelograms are rectangles. Now we're going to say that P is the point where B, E and C, F intersect, and then we're going to try and show that P also lies on the line A, D. Now first look up at the top of the diagram and notice that triangle GHA is congruent to ACB. By the construction with parallel lines, we've got GH being the side of this square, so AC, GA being the side of this square, so the same as AB, and both those triangles are right angled. So we have side angle side congruence, and angle GAH is equal to angle ABC. But that angle ABC is also equal to DAC, they're both a right angle minus angle ACB. And if GAH is equal to DAC, then we see that HAD is a straight line. So rather than testing whether P lies on AD, what we're going to do instead is test whether A lies on HP, is HAPD, or the straight line. Now this is where all the complementary rectangles come in. Since P lies on BE, the two red rectangles here have the same area. And since it's on CF, we can then add a third equal rectangle. Now, if we compare these two here and remove the shared area from them, we see that the shaded rectangles AQWG and AJXR are equal. And those are the complementary rectangles generated by A on the diagonal HP. So A really is on that diagonal. So HAPD is a straight line as required. Well, I've got to admit, I'm a complete sucker for geometry proofs where you add in lots and lots of constructions that then lead to a quick solution because they feel a little bit like a magic trick. But I hope you've understood why Heron's constructions do have a clear motivation because of this quite powerful idea of using complementary parallelograms as a test for whether a point lies on a line or not. That's certainly not a test that I was very familiar with previously, but perhaps I need to use it more in the future when I'm having a go at Olympiad problems myself. If you've enjoyed this, do feel free to share the video and consider subscribing to the channel for more ideas from ancient Greek maths in future videos. Thank you very much for watching.